In the headlines, Hong Kong protesters continue their rally calling for universal suffrage and threaten to take over government buildings if a chief executive, C.Y. Lung, doesn't step down. In Incheon, the two Koreas go up against each other in the Asian Games men's football final, while other team gold medal events for South Korea are also on the line in basketball and volleyball. And Asia's top film festival kicks off in Korea's Busan with the world premiere of Taiwanese drama Paradise in Service. The festival, showcasing over 300 titles from nearly 80 countries, runs through next Saturday. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the newscast. Coming to you live from Seoul, I am Kang Tae-ri. We begin with the news on North Korea. Reports coming out of Washington suggest that Pyongyang has carried out another engine test for the KN-08, North Korea's intercontinental ballistic missile. The regime is also suspected to have upgraded one of its major rocket launching sites. Our Chi myung tells us more. U.S.-based think tank 38 North says satellite imagery shows the missile's first stage engine was tested in mid-August at the Sohae launch site in North Korea's northwestern Dongchangni region. This adds to a series of engine tests Pyongyang has carried out since 2013. It remains unclear how successful these tests have been, though. Security expert Joel Witt, who runs a 38 North website at John Hopkins University, says North Korea could be moving on to full-scale tests of the KN-08 because these kind of engine tests are normally stepping stones to that end. The missile is believed to have a range of at least 5,500 kilometers, which means the U.S. state of Alaska is within its range. North Korea is not only testing engines either. It has also completed a major program to upgrade the Sohae satellite launching station that began late last year. A gantry tower was raised to 55 meters by adding three new platforms to handle up to 50 meter long rockets. The existing launch pad has been upgraded to launch rockets even larger than the Unha 3 North Korea sent into space in late 2012. With the completion of the engine test, 38 North says Pyongyang may decide to test fire another rocket before the year is out. A new, even larger rocket than the Unha 3 is also reportedly under development, but the website says it'll be several years before it's fully operational. Jim young Arirang News. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says resuming the six-party talks on denuclearizing North Korea would be complicated but not out of the question. Meeting with his North Korean counterpart in Moscow on Wednesday, the foreign minister called on all related parties in the dialogue to take a balanced approach and refrain from abrupt actions that would polarize positions. The two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia began the six-party talks back in 2003 with the aim of denuclearizing North Korea, but the framework came to a halt with the last meeting in 2008 as North Korea launched a long-range rocket in early 2009. If you're considering joining the military or are just simply curious about what life is like as a member of the Korean Armed Forces, here's a chance to get to first-hand experience. Our Kim Hyun-bin tells us all about this year's Ground Forces Festival. Since all able-bodied men in Korea are required to serve in the military, they are well aware of what it's like to live as a cadet day in and day out. But that leaves a large segment of the population, women and children included, that aren't. To enhance understanding, the Army headquarters opened the 12th Ground Forces Festival in Kaeryong City this week under the theme, An Army That Connects With The People. The Ground Forces Festival is the country's largest military fair. It offers visitors a chance to see, hear and experience all aspects of the Army. There are 51 events people can take part in. People can get in the cockpit of an attack helicopter or inside tanks, in addition to many other hands-on activities. One of the most popular sections is a shooting range, where people can fire off a real rifle using blank rounds. (laughs) 
Special military performances and stunts are also scheduled throughout the day. All men must go to the army and get to experience this, but women cannot. Through this festival, we can get a glimpse of what soldiers go through. It was fun. Those that have gone so far have enjoyed the experience. My kids are curious about the life of military personnel and they wanted to ride on the helicopter and tanks. They had the chance to do so and loved it. I would like to give my sincere gratitude to the Army, the Ministry of National Defense and all the soldiers helping out. There's also a boot camp arena where one can test their might and agility. The mock towers, which are used for parachute training, are another popular attraction where people can jump from a height of 11 meters. The festival runs through this Sunday, October 5th. Kim Abin, Arirang News, Kaerong City. Every Wednesday here in Korea, victims of Japan's sexual enslavement of women during world time, wartime gather with their supporters to hold a rally. And that weekly protest has been taking place for more than two decades now. But uh, according to our Kwon Soa, this week they were joined by a special group of supporters. In front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul, at a weekly Wednesday gathering dedicated to the women who were forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese military during World War II, Japanese Christians join in. As a Japanese citizen, I want to sincerely apologize for the violation of your dignity and human rights. I want to apologize to the victims of sexual slavery and for the unresolved pain it caused. I am so very sorry. The surviving victims thanked them for coming and said it was the Japanese government that was at fault, not the Japanese people. When you go back to Japan, please tell Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to stop making these absurd remarks. I hope the truth is spread to more people so that we can find peace before we die. While the Japanese pastor's heartfelt gesture shows that there are ordinary Japanese citizens who are ashamed of the atrocities that were carried out by their country in the past, Tokyo continues to turn a deaf ear to the demands of the victims. On the same day, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said the sexual slavery issue needed to be revised in school textbooks, another sign that the Japanese government is trying to whitewash history. But he added that he has no plans to make changes to the 1993 Kono Statement, a landmark apology to the victims of wartime sexual enslavement, or publish a new one. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. In politics, the floor leader of Korea's main opposition party has decided to step down from her post after just five months at the helm. In an email sent to all members of the New Politics Alliance for Democracy this morning, Park Yeon-sun said it was with a heavy heart that she was resigning. She said she had gone through a difficult time as floor leader, having to give up her beliefs, honor and pride in the name of responsibility, and that now she was laying down that burden. Her decision follows months of political gridlock over a special bill aimed at setting up ground rules for an investigation into the April Ferry disaster. Today's announcement comes just two days after the ruling and main opposition parties reached a compromise on this controversial bill. For the latest in news that impacts Korea and the world. Join Kang Cheri for a lively half hour that covers politics, business, international news, and much more. Live at 8 every weeknight on Arirang TV. Korea's exports to its largest trading partner, China, rebounded in September. But the real question to be asking is, is this going to stay as a trend? Our Kana Kim reports on the prospects for the rest of the year and the longer-term challenges Korea faces. For most Korean policymakers and businessmen, one of the most encouraging signs from September trade data is a rise in exports to China. Outgoing shipments to Korea's largest trading partner rebounded for the first time in five months. The total came in at 12.7 billion won, or roughly 12 million U.S. dollars in September, up 6.5 percent from a year earlier. 
More importantly, the gain came mostly in intermediary goods that are fitted by Chinese exporters in their finished products. Shipments rose by more than 50 percent for computer parts, some 32 percent for semiconductors, and 13 percent for petrochemical products. Now that's welcome news for Korea as parts and other basic components represent nearly three quarters of all of its exports to China. Korea is well positioned due to the improved results and this upward trend is expected to continue throughout the end of the year. Chinese exports have been on the rise since May, showing an upward trend. Trade officials say a recovery in the U.S. economy will keep boosting Chinese exports to America in the coming months, particularly in the run-up to the year-end shopping season. The longer-term worry is China's determination to foster its own parts industry. China is improving its own supply capacity. Korean firms should now focus on producing high-quality products to differentiate themselves from Chinese suppliers. Negotiations for the Korea-China Free Trade Agreement are in the final stages. And with expectations that it will be signed by the end of the year, the future of trade between the two countries appears bright. Connie Kim, Arirang News. The leaders of South Korea and Vietnam have agreed to strengthen ties and conclude a bilateral free trade agreement negotiations by the end of this year. President Park Geun-hye and the Vietnamese Communist Party chief Ng Wen Phu Trung also signed an MOU today, promising the Korean government's $12 billion financial support for Korean companies looking to enter the Vietnamese market and build a transportation infrastructure. Vietnam is Korea's number nine trade. Partner. Korea's financial regulator says it's coming out with a set of measures to revitalize Korea's stock market sometime this month. Although the Financial Services Commission's chairman Shin Jae-yoon did not reveal too much details today when speaking to ruling party lawmakers, a key part of the plan is expected to be easing the daily limit on stock price changes. Chairman Shin has recently talked about his plans to ease regulation on stock price movement movement in both stock indices in Korea next year from the current 15 percent to 30 percent, saying the stock market should play the role of raising venture capital. Korea's largest film festival, which is annual, opens on this, uh, in the southern port city of Busan with a grand opening ceremony tonight. Throughout the 10-day event, over 300 films from nearly 80 countries will be screened, including the opening film, A Paradise and Service, from Taiwan. While 12 films by up-and-coming Asian filmmakers from 12 countries will compete for this festival's main competition section, New Currents category, the festival offers special attention to Georgian female filmmakers and Turkish cinema. Since its inception back in 1996, the festival has focused on discovering and introducing Asian film talents and their works. Tomorrow is a national holiday here in Korea known as Kecheonjo. It's held in celebration of the country's founding thousands of years ago and centers around a legend that um, not many of you may be familiar with. Our Kim Jian tells us more. This Friday, Korea celebrates National Foundation Day, or Kecheonjo in Korean, which literally translates into the day the sky was open. The story behind the holiday dates back more than 4,000 years to a tale of Emperor Tangun. It begins with Hwanung, the son of a god who lived in the heavens but wanted to live on earth. He descended and ruled over the people with the noble aim of benefiting mankind. Then two animals, a bear and a tiger, came and begged Hwanung to let them become human. Hwanung agreed to grant their wish, but only if they endured 100 days without exposure to sunlight, with only garlic and souk, a type of mugwort, as their diet. The tiger gave up halfway through, but the bear persevered and became a woman. She later bore Hwanung a son, who would be called Tangun. Even to this day, Emperor Tangun is considered to be the founder of this nation, and his mixed ancestry of a bear and deity has become a symbol for national identity. Various festivities will be held Friday and Saturday to celebrate National Foundation Day, meaning traffic restrictions will be in place for some areas. 
On Friday from midnight to 4 p.m., no cars will be allowed on the streets of Yeongdongdaeru and Bongunsaru near Samsung Station and Coex due to an international marathon event. There's going to be a massive parade starting at around 11 a.m. on Friday, beginning at Sejongno Park and ending near Toksugun Palace by Seoul City Hall Nation. And the Seoul International Fireworks Festival will be held on Saturday, so automobiles will be restricted from accessing the southern part of Mapo Bridge and near the 63 building near Yoinaru Station from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. on Saturday. Kim ji Anirang News. We continue our coverage on the growing protest in Hong Kong. Activist leaders are threatening to storm government buildings unless uh, the city's embattled leader, uh, chief executive, steps down by the end of today, Thursday. And for more, Paul is joining us from the news center. Paul, the clock is ticking down, and it looks like the Hong Kong authorities there are not budging. That's right. Chief Executive C.Y. Long has until the stroke of midnight to answer the ultimatum with thousands of demonstrators surrounding his offices as of this morning. China is closely monitoring the situation and has been very firm in its stance despite increasing scrutiny from Western powers. Our Kim In-ji reports. Pro-democracy protesters have warned of further action if Hong Kong's chief executive does not step down by Thursday evening. Security was heightened around C. Y. Liang's office as massive crowds rallied outside. Protesters say they will occupy government buildings if their demands aren't met. They also want universal suffrage in Hong Kong's 2017 elections and for Beijing to abandon its plan to vet candidates for the post of chief executive. Uh, I don't know how long, but I think that every Hong Kongers uh, will spend all their efforts to achieve what they want and voice out their opinion and until the government get action and respond our needs. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry at a joint press conference with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi in Washington called on Hong Kong authorities to exercise restraint in the face of protests. Wang was curt in his response. The Chinese government has very firmly and clearly stated its position. Hong Kong affairs are China's internal affairs. All countries should respect China's sovereignty. Wang added that illegal acts that violate public order would not be tolerated in any society. If protesters follow through on their pledge to storm government buildings, there are mounting fears of violent clashes. China's official state newspaper, The People's Daily, supported Leung and praised his performance while accusing the protest of driving Hong Kong into chaos. The Daily earlier warned of unimaginable consequences should the protest persist. Kim min Arirang News. Meanwhile, thousands of people around the world are showing their support for the pro-democracy movement, many of them in New York City. Supporters gathered Wednesday under the lights of Times Square to rally in solidarity with those in Hong Kong. New York has been one of the several dozen cities across the globe to host such demonstrations, including Paris, Melbourne, and Macau. Mm, certainly. And um, health officials in the U.S., Paul, say they're closely monitoring a second patient that may be infected with Ebola just a day after the first case of this virus was confirmed in that country. Fears are running high. And this could spark an outbreak outside West Africa. What's the current situation? Well, the director of Dallas County's health department said Wednesday that the second person is under strict observation, but he stressed there is no risk to the public since the virus was contained. This fresh alert comes as Thomas Eric Duncan was confirmed by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as the first Ebola patient on American soil. Federal health officials say he first picked up the disease while living in Liberia, raising concerns of inadequate health checks at international airports. However, Tom Kenyon, the director of the CDC, said it was more evidence of the global nature of the health threat. This was not a failure of, of the screening process uh, at the airport. It was, it's one of the realities that we've pointed to with this epidemic being so big and so historical that it's inevitable the longer this epidemic exists, the bigger it gets. The, the greater the risk of importation events like we've just seen. 
Duncan was reportedly not sick during his flight from Liberia to Dallas last month. Hospital officials say his condition has been improving since he was placed in isolation on Sunday. Mm. And staying in the U.S., uh, the director of the U.S. Secret Service has resigned after a major security breach at the White House. We did touch on the story before, but it looks like this armed intruder not only made it past the front door, but also into the heart of the presidential building. Yeah, and that was confirmed by the now former director of the Secret Service, Julia Pearson. She said the man had entered the White House through an unlocked door with a knife, then ran past a Secret Service agent into the East Room before finally being tackled to the ground. The incident follows a string of security lapses by the Presidential Protection Branch, including an armed security guard with a criminal record being allowed to share an elevator with President Obama. Speaking at a congressional hearing on Tuesday, Pearson accepted full responsibility. I'm here today to address the concern that we all share following the incident of September 19th at the White House. It's clear that our security plan was not properly executed. This is unacceptable, and I take full responsibility, and I will make sure that it does not happen again. Meanwhile, Omar Gonzalez, a suspect accused of breaching the White House, has pleaded not guilty. A federal court ordered on Wednesday a full mental evaluation for the Iraq War veteran, a move that his defense lawyers have opposed. Mm. And finally, the iconic soda maker Pepsi has launched its newest soft drink in an exclusive deal with online retail giant Amazon. Is this just a new marketing scheme, or does this mean a major shift in, its, um, in this international company's strategy? Well, the product is called Pepsi True, and it's a naturally sweetened soda pop. It will be available later this month online, but the company says you won't be able to buy it on store shelves just yet. By introducing the new drink through Amazon, Pepsi says it can better assess demand and gain insight into where people are buying it ahead of a wider launch in traditional stores. Analysts say the move illustrates how the food and beverage industry is expanding into e-commerce as it searches for new growth engines. Amazon and e-commerce are driving a lot of the retail growth in the U.S. and the beverage companies are very underrepresented on Amazon because of their bottling systems. So it's a way to launch a product with, um, to get some high media exposure. The move comes as the sale of carbonated soft drinks in the United States have been on the decline for nearly a decade. Market watchers say it's due to consumers being more health conscious and wary of the possible health risks of artificial sweeteners. Charity? All right, Paul, thank you so much for those stories. And we'll see you back here in just about two hours. Hello and welcome. I'm Stephen Che with your Asian Games update. And first things first, it's the men's football finals featuring the inter-Korean rivals. South Korea and North Korea put all their differences aside and met on the pitch to battle for the coveted gold. And there it's a rough start with South Korea leading possession. Scores are nil-nil in the first half. And on to the modern pentathlon. It all got started with the women's final on this rainy Thursday. And for those of you wondering, it's a mix of fencing, swimming, horse jumping, running and shooting, and just as grueling as the traditional version. And South Korean ladies bolstered by Yang Soojin scored 5,120 points for the well-deserved team gold. China's Wang Wei, meanwhile, earned the top individual honors. And more medal matches, this time to the men's handball finals. The favorites, South Korea, faced off against their toughest opponents yet, Qatar. And the defending champ, South Korea, meet the wall. That's the Qatari defense in the first half, and it's more of the same in the second. Qatar puts on an impressive run, beating South Korea 24-21 for the gold. And on to the latest medal events in the women's basketball final. South Korea beats China 70-64 for their first gold since 1994. In the women's volleyball final, it's South Korea versus China again. And the Koreans actually win this one just minutes ago, two sets 
to none. And finally, in the rhythmic gymnastics all around final, Son Yun Jae currently leads, having gotten first in three of four apparatuses. And that's all I have for now. I'll see you back here at 10 for the full wrap up. I'll see you later. Hello and welcome. At the moment, it is raining here in Seoul as well as in other places as we head into a three-day weekend. Now, more rainfall is forecast. 5 to 10 millimeters are expected for Seoul as well as parts of Kahono province. Elsewhere down south, less than 5 millimeters. Now, this should gradually clear up by later tonight and the rainfall should cool things down even more. So make sure to dress warmly. Tomorrow is Korea's National Foundation Day and showers may fall from time to time along the eastern coast, but conditions should clear up nicely over the weekend. Over in Incheon, where the Asian Games are taking place, daytime highs there tomorrow will hit 21 degrees with breezy winds. On to the readings. Seoul will reach 23, Daegu and Busan 26, Gwangju 24. On to other places. Jeju hits 23, Dokdo 19, Mangkumgang 10. That's all for now and back to you, Teddy. Thank you very much, Bo Young, and that will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching.